Well, we are today going to finish off the story of the Alaskan Adventure, 1982. Lessons I learned on that journey and uh, praying that it'll be something that might be helpful to you as you journey through life. I usually on a sermon go verse by verse through the scriptures, but in this uh, case I've been just, uh, putting the scriptures up front and then letting the story unfold, which uh, hopefully will illustrate them as we go on. And so uh, the things that I have been emphasizing in this little series are the fact that first of all, that, that God has plans for us. He delights to bless us. He has things in store for us that uh, are beyond even what we might've hoped or dreamed. Psalm 37 verse four, delight thyself also in the Lord and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. The second point is that uh, God brings people into our lives to speak into our lives, to help us in life. People that will create a, a hunger or a curiosity. I had people that were telling me about Alaska who had lived there, people that had visited there. And uh, God brings people in our lives that create a spiritual hunger, a curiosity, and people that will help us on our way as we step out in faith and in that journey. Romans 12, verse 4, for as in one body, we have many members and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. We need each other. Friends are flowers in the garden of life. On the other side of that, be aware that there are people that can point us in the wrong direction. So choose your friends carefully. And finally, that God superintends our steps. Proverbs 16, 9, the heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. The fact is that someday we're going to look back from eternity and see a big chessboard and the moves that God's the grand master that had his strategies and purposes that many times we couldn't even see at the time. But looking back, we'll realize he did have good. He did have plans and purposes to give us a future and a hope. And uh, sometimes we get to see that even in this life. And I certainly experienced that on, on my journey across Alaska. And I'm so thankful to be able to share that with you today. Uh, Hebrews 11:8. by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out and he went out not knowing where he was going. <laughs> and I can, I can relate to that. I had an idea where I wanted to go, but the Lord directed my steps day by day, hour by hour. But before we step onto the Chilkoot Trail today, one side note, this this week I discovered there's a fascinating connection between Yakima and the Klondike Gold Rush. Uh, if you're familiar with Yakima, you know there's uh, Congdon's Castle out in West Valley. Well, not far from that is another castle, a uh, building on 48th Avenue, which became known as Carboneau Castle. It's probably more familiar to you nowadays as the findery gift shop and, and floral shop. It was built by an amazing entrepreneur lady back in 1910. Uh, she came to Yakima after the gold rush. She was known as the richest woman in the Klondike because she sold goods and services to the uh, gold seekers. She has a tremendous savvy business sense and uh, made her fortune. And for some reason, she settled here in Yakima in 1910, built that. Uh, she was a, a woman of sufficient stature and prestige and fame that even President William Taft came to visit her here in her home back in the day. Uh, so if you wanna find out more about one of the most colorful characters in the history of Yakima, uh, look up the name Belinda Mulroney Carboneau or just Google the richest woman in the Klondike. But back to business, let's strap on our backpacks again as we step off the train car up at Bennett Lake and, 
get ready to head out on the highlight of my whole Alaskan adventure. Uh, this is the same challenging 33 mile hike that the original gold seekers covered as they started out on their journey toward the gold fields in 1898. It's Chilkoot trail time. And as you may recall from last time, I eagerly headed out and almost immediately got lost. I headed out after uh, our lunch there and, and before long I got lost. I thought, man, I don't see the trail. There was no real trail anyhow. I got off in the brush and trees and found myself in a box canyon that I had to either climb up or, or uh, hike back out. So I thought, well, I'll just climb up. And, I, and then I thought, man, if I fall, there's only probably 30 feet that I was climbing up these rocks. It was steep enough. I left my backpack down on the ground and pulled it up by rope later. But I thought if I get lost or if I get <laughs> broken leg or something here, this is going to be a bear that finds me. <laughs> Uh, they may not find anything in me except my little backpacking bell, but uh, made it back. And then I discovered there were piles of rocks uh, here and there as you traveled, uh, some of them with sticks coming up out of them, some of them that didn't. But these rock cairns, that was how you knew your, your journey. Uh, you stay on the course that way. And I think the spiritual lesson there is that we need to watch and we need to look. You know, there were tens of thousands of people that had passed that way and knew where to go. And I, I would be better off to follow their course than to just chart my own off through the wilderness. So I headed out and made better uh, headway after that. Uh, and uh, as I was hiking along or maybe stopped for rest, I heard the sound of splashing in the lake nearby to me. And I looked and there was a mother moose and her calf that were just, you know, a few feet off from shore, hiking out through the, the edge of the lake. And I had heard that the mother moose is worse than the mother bear. You don't want to meet one, but I thought I'd really like to get a picture. So I set up my camera and I put it to, uh, right next to a tree that I knew I could climb if she started charging at me. So <laughs> she came into view and I pushed the button on my camera and it clicked and she stopped looked all around and I'm getting ready to climb the tree, but uh, waited after about 30 seconds of sniffing around, looking around, she took off again. I said, thank you, Jesus. So <laughs> she headed out and I continued hiking that day. Once again, it's the land of the midnight sun. It was still daylight. You could hike all night if you had the stamina, but I uh, uh, emerged out of the, the tundra and the trees uh, came up to the snow fields, decided to, to bed down for the night at a place there was another tent there with people that had already gone to bed and my socks were wet from hiking in the snow already so I decided I'd dry them out. And the, uh, the woodsman secret of you take a twig and split it in half and then you can hold your socks on the line with that. I took a twig and my knife and I sliced down the twig and it broke off and went straight into my thumb. I still got a, a bit of a scar from that, but it sliced it open. And it was bleeding profusely. I don't know. Uh, I, I was able to stop the bleeding by pressing with my other hand. But when I'd release it to try and, and wind it up with a bandage, it would start bleeding so much it's just going to soak ban the bandage. So I thought I could go over and wake these people up. Uh, in their tent, but I don't want to do that. But then I, I was right camping on this uh, stream that was coming straight off the snow fields. So I took my thumb and I stuck it in the icy water. And immediately my blood vessels constricted and uh, the bleeding stopped. And uh, held in there for a while. I was able to get my things together, and pull it out and bandage it enough before it started bleeding again. But uh, but the spiritual lesson from that is when I was looking down at my thumb that was split open, I was saying, this is not good. This is not natural. It's not normal. And you, you know what? Sin is not normal. It's a wound in our spirit. And, and what will stop the, the wound and, and allow healing and, and the bleeding to stop is uh, we come and we bring it to Jesus and we plunge our hearts into the river that he's made for us. But... Uh, 
sin is not normal. It's not healthy. It's not good. And I, I had wounded my thumb, but how often do we wound our spirits by the things that we do and sometimes things that other people do to us as well that we need healing from. But I did not unbandage my hand for the next three days till I got down to Skagway. I was afraid what I was going to see and am I going to need stitches. Uh, I, I split my thumb at a church picnic up at Brooks Park one time with a hatchet and good old Doc German, our dentist uh, friend from our church, uh, uh, told me to come over to the office after I got home and he put a, he put a uh, stitch in there for me to keep it from splitting apart and keep breaking open. So I thought this is a lot worse <laughs> than that. But it healed together. It was throbbing for, you know, I was hiking with my thumb above my above my backpack, above my shoulders. Uh, I was not hitching a ride, sticking my thumb up at this point, but just trying to keep the, the blood uh, from flowing down to that so much. And so I headed out the next day. It was uh, beautiful weather. Uh, in Chilkoot uh, Trail, I talked to a ranger on the trail, said she'd never seen it in 10 years or 15 years she'd been on it. Three beautiful days. It can, you can have snow whiteouts in the month of July uh, because the, it's such a steep uh, incline when it comes off the ocean there. Just within a few miles it shoots up 2,500 feet from 1,000 foot to 3,500 feet just uh, almost vertical and, and the weather, moisture, clouds release and so I was blessed. Uh, I was blessed as I hiking across. You get off the trail and you could go waist deep in snow. Uh, you can walk in over places or you can hear water streaming beneath you and you wonder what would happen if I was to break through here. But uh, as I continued on my way, uh, you know, I'm up probably 3,000 feet in the, the deep snow fields. And uh, there, you know, they're going to be uh, tests, uh, uh, temptations if you're on a beach in Hawaii or something uh, as a young guy and, and girls uh, that are not dressed appropriately. Uh, but you don't expect that on the Chilkoot Trail up in the high snow fields. But as I was hiking along, here came three girls, backpackers, backpacks on their back and their hiking pants were also on their backpacks. They were drying them out, uh, walking there in their panties underwear were straight toward me and I'm, I had to make a decision. What thoughts am I going to entertain? <laughs> Where are my eyes going to look? So as they got close to me, I just look them in the eye and say, hi ladies, boy, beautiful weather we're having up here. <laughs> and uh, and they said, yeah, and they walked on their way and, and by the grace of God, I kept looking forward. I didn't uh, turn around and stare or anything and, and just kept going on. But I just thought, Spiritual lesson here, you, you, Satan never lets up. You, you can never think I'm going to get beyond uh, temptation or that he is going to just take it easy on me at, at that elevation in a snowfield. Uh, here, here come these girls. And so anyhow, I kept on my way, made it up to, to the pass, uh, Chilkoot Pass, 3,500 feet elevation. Then you hike down and I was going backwards from what the original uh, gold seekers did. Uh, they, uh, it was still treacherous though, I think from what my wife has told me of hiking in the North Cascades, Algard Pass, Asgard or Algard Pass, whatever it is, up to the Alpine Lakes there is probably something similar, but you just walking from rock to rock and snow here and there and trying to get down, made it down to the lower level and, and was able to set up camp for the night. I had to watch out for for bear. And there were places the post that said, don't camp here, there's bear activity. And, and uh, so I uh, didn't want somebody to find my, my little backpack and bell without me there. So I kept going and, and uh, uh, found a place to camp. The next day I got up and to hike out. It was Sunday. And uh, this time the trail was not so rocky and treacherous. Uh, that's uh, spiritual life. There are days like that. This time it was just uh, sloggy and froggy. <laughs> a couple inches of water and my new Gore-Tex hiking boots didn't do much good when you're hiking through a little stream most of the way and there were these tiny little frogs that just were an annoyance. You step 
and squish them, and, uh, and they're just getting in the way. I told my my little niece at the time, Debbie, I made up a little song that was adapted from another one about I praise Jesus when I wake up in the morning and go through the day, and when frogs get in my way, I still praise Jesus because he brightens up my day. And she liked that. She still remembers it. But some days, uh, some days are treacherous, and one slip could mean disaster. Other days, it's just the the annoyances, the irritations, and slogging along. But I made it. I knew I'd be in Skagway that night. I could dry out my shoes, and and so got to the trailhead down by Daiea, where we still have to hitchhike ten miles into town, and and uh, I got there in time for the. Sunday evening service at Skagway Assembly of God. Uh, there was the pastor was not in town that night. He was uh, out of town, but his uh, his daughter had a, a guy that was interested in her. Eventually, they married, but he was there for the summer doing uh, uh, intern pastor work from Northwest College. I think he said, "Sure, you can stay the night here." So they set me up for the night. Next morning, I headed down to the dock and caught the, the Columbia, the biggest ferry that travels the inland waterway. Some places, you know, you could throw a rock on either side practically. It's so narrow. The waterway, this is the biggest boat that navigates it. And I, I got on board. It's kind of like homesteading. In the uh, early Alaska days, you just take out your place on the deck and roll out your sleeping bag or backpack. And that's your home for the next three days. Uh, and the people around about you, it's kind of like a little village and you get neighbors and friends. And, and uh, so we headed out. First night we were made it to Juneau. And I uh, want to see the town, but it's about 10 miles out the dock from where you go. So I hitched a ride in, looked around Juneau a little bit, and then thought as I was having trouble catching rides getting back, I hope I don't miss the ferry. <laughs> What am I going to do? Well, my stuff is on the ferry. The, you know, my friends were watching it. And uh, also, how am I going to get home? But uh, I made it with a little bit of time to spare. Pulled out my sleeping bag, went to sleep. Woke up the next morning. We're still in Juneau. There had been engine trouble in the ferry. Unfortunately, because of that, had to just make quick stops. I wasn't in, able to go in at, uh, at the other stops along the way, St. Petersburg and whatever. But... But anyhow, I uh, enjoyed the, the trip. Uh, some of my friends there were actually musicians from, I think, Fresno, California area. They did nightclubs and bars and things. And so they had guitars, so we had a great time, get out the instruments and play along. And everybody joined around us singing, you know, folk songs, Peter, Paul, and Mary, and John Denver type stuff. And, and they invited me if I ever came down to to Fresno that I could sit in with them on a gig or two at their, at their nightclubs and bars. I never was able to get down there, but I did send them a postcard. I wrote a lot of, of postcards, uh, people that had helped me on the way, including one that I wrote to, to Ben, just to let him know that I valued him and that God cared about him. But uh, we, uh, we got near the end of the, I think it was a three-day journey through the inland waterway there. Once again, I had been eating peanut butter and honey the whole trip, including now. Uh, just buying new loaves of bread and breaking out the peanut butter and honey. And they made an announcement as we approached Seattle. They said, well, the cafeteria is needing to close out their food, so we've got uh, everything's half price. And so I uh, dined on halibut, <laughs> my last meal, my last supper of that trip. And boy, was that good. I enjoyed it uh, so much, and then I, we pulled into Pier 48, and here was Walt and Paula, and also Cindy Long. Our friend was uh, waiting there for me, so weary pilgrim, welcome home. They they picked me up, and uh, friends are flowers in the garden of life, uh, and sure, surely they were a blessing to me there. Uh, took me to the airport to begin with, picked me up when I get home, and... Uh, but I still needed to ride home. Well, uh, in the providence of God, Walt and Paula, who had uh, moved away from Zilla years before, moved down to Monterey, California. Then they were in Bellevue for 
some years as Walt was working for the State Patrol. In the providence of God, this was the week that they were moving back to Yakima. And so I was able to help them load up their truck and catch a ride. And, and uh, they brought me home and, and they came home and have been home ever since. Uh, they uh, are in our church here today. But just the, the steps of a, a man are ordered by the Lord. He, we plan our ways and do the best we can, but the way that God just brings the things together. Uh, interesting thing also that uh, what Yvonne and I were at a, a church uh, development clinic here in Ellensburg quite a few years later. We're sitting with a pastor from another uh, town here in Washington State, and he looked familiar as we got acquainted. He, he said, yeah, I did an internship one summer up at Skagway, Alaska, where my father-in-law now is the pa was the pastor. And I said, oh, I, I slept in Skagway Church one night. I said, well, that's you. <laughs> I remember you. Uh, and I don't know why God brings these coincidences and things into our lives, but it's just I think to remind us that he is superintending, superintending our steps. And he brings us together and friends are flowers in the garden of life and people are a blessing to us. And so uh, it just happened that uh, that, it, that was just the perfect time. Uh, Walt and Paula were headed home and they, they brought me with them. Uh, and uh, so God superintends our steps. He superintends our lives. I like the last line of of uh, the, the the verse there in the the song uh, life's railway to heaven uh, you know especially appropriate after riding the yukon and white pass railway down to bennett lake uh, and but uh, god's uh, superintending of our steps the last verse says as you roll across the trestle spanning jordan's swelling tide you behold the union depot into which your train will glide now the the imagery here spanning Jordan's swelling tide and the you know the old Negro spirituals Michael row the boat ashore the angel Michael uh, rowing them home Jordan's river is deep and wide milk and honey on the other side the promised land that Jordan River separated the children of Israel from the wilderness from the promised land looking forward to the promised land someday and milk and honey on the other side well I had peanut butter and honey enough on my trip. <laughs> Milk and honey sound pretty good, but it's a picture of death. Uh, of, uh, the superintendent, the guy that, the, the one that has guided us through our lives, he's gonna gu guide us across the final step, the final shore as we cross uh, the imagery here of spanning Jordan's swelling tide. Uh, as I was preparing this message and uh, just the weekend before I first presented it here in, in Yakima uh, two days before that I stood in the graveside in Zilla where my friend uh, Gary Morford was being laid to rest uh, I remember Gary from the early days of revival in Zilla he was not a guy from a Christian background not the uh, candidate likely to, to be involved in a spiritual awakening but he was uh, I can remember him coming down to the 530 uh, we had an uh, hour of prayer uh, for quite some time. He, he wouldn't come ordinarily. I remember him waking up one morning and saying, I just woke up and decided I better come down here and joined us uh, there for that time. And He worked at Stadelman's. I, I uh, drove forklifts and he repaired them. <laughs> and we had a lot of good talks. And through the years, he grew spiritually and, and uh, we stayed in touch. In fact, when my dad and Betty had their honeymoon, in Hawaii, it was Gary Morford and Carolyn that accompanied uh, my wife and I and and uh, Dad and Betty there for a week in Hawaii. So uh, friends are flowers in the garden of life. But I, I think that uh, I was thinking in terms of this, as you roll across the trestle spanning Jordan's swelling tide, you'll behold the Union Depot into which your train will glide. Terry or Gary, I believe cross that trestle and that he's there to meet the superintendent. We see his hand, we see the evidence of his working and caring and directing and guarding and guiding and leading and feeding in our lives, but uh, I'm looking forward to one day seeing him. But uh, as, I, as I stood there in the cemetery, I looked and here 
are people that have been such a part of my life for through the years. Uh, Ken and Sue Guest, who, when my family moved to to uh, Zilla from Goldendale back in 1965, it was Ken and Sue uh, in the church. Ken that came and picked us up in Goldendale in his truck and helped us to move with our stuff. Them and their kids there. How God has worked and moved and blessed. Here's uh, Chuck and Lynn Kelly. Chuck, the uh, wild guy in my class that uh, became a, a born-again believer, got saved in jail and uh, still walking with the Lord. Here's the, the Knobs and the Logstons. And, and uh, of all people, here's Rich Culver, the guy that was the principal there in Zilla back in the day that uh, that uh, gave me the ticket, to lined me up to get the ticket to go to Alaska in the first place and told me all the stories. Here's Rich, who was there to say farewell to Gary. An interesting side note too, how God directs our steps. Rich's stepson, Richie, was a, a dear part of our church for some time, uh, not because of anything we had connected until we figured out later here how this was, but God just uh, brings things. He superintends our steps. I just talked to Richie on the phone last week, but, but uh, also in the, in the cemetery there, Walt and Paula, they come down to say farewell to, to Gary. And uh, just, uh, you know, if I, friends are flowers in the garden of life, I, I've probably, if there's anybody that's been like a brother to me through the years, it's Walt. Uh, when I first moved to Zilla from Goldendale, he was my first friend, and it's been ever since. Uh, Paula used to come up in her family to Goldendale when her dad pastored in Buena when she was in grade school, and we were, we'd play, play card games and fellowship together. Uh, but God superintends our steps. God leads us. God guides us along, but the way is not always easy. That uh, mountain railway, there are uh, 440,000 people to get off the the boats in Alaska, the cruise ships, and and take that uh, mountain railway up to Carcross from Skagway in a in a non-COVID year. Majestic, beautiful uh, sight, uh, and and yet uh, get too close to the edge, and you kind of wonder. It made me think of when I was a little kid in Disneyland. Got to go when I was in grade school, and one of my fondest memories is the Jungle Cruise. You get on this boat that's going through the jungle and. And there are crocodiles, king cobras, there's headhunters and hippos that are going to attack you. There are waterfalls you just seem like inches away from going over and wild gorillas. And, and for a little kid that doesn't understand, that could be terrifying. But uh, as you understand, it, it, that boat is on a track. You can't see it. It's underwater, but it's on a track and you're not really in danger. Uh, if you stay in the boat, you're going to be okay. And as we take life's mountain railway to heaven, stay on the train, stay on track. You're going to be okay. It's not uh, there. Is, it's not that you're just left to your own devices and have to worry and, and fret and everything else. So I just want to encourage you to get on board if you never have. You know, when I flew to Alaska from Seattle to Anchorage, uh, I didn't pay for that ticket. Somebody else had it and they weren't going to use it and they gave it to me. I didn't pay for it. I, I received the benefit of it. Uh, I didn't pay my way to heaven. I'm going there because Jesus paid it. Uh, and I come to him and say, Jesus, I believe. You know, it took faith for me to believe that they would actually give me that ticket. When I got over to Seattle, that guy handed me his ticket and I took it. And then it still took faith to believe this is going to get me through. And uh, the ticket person asking, how come my ID is not the name matches up here? And they let me in. Well, when I get to heaven, it's not my ID that's going to get me in. It's Jesus' ID. He's recognized. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to the Father but by Him. And so if you haven't ever got on board, I, I encourage you to do that. And if you've gotten off track, uh, may I encourage you to get back on track today. Just... Uh, Believe and receive, uh, repent, get back on track. And uh, and I want to finish up with uh, the last verse in the chorus of that Life's Mountain Railway to Heaven. As you roll across the trestle, spanning Jordan, swelling tide, you behold the 
Union Depot into which your train will glide there you meet the superintendent God the Father God the Son Joyous greeting, weary pilgrim, welcome home. Blessed Savior, thou wilt guide us till we reach that blissful shore where the angels wait to join us in God's praise forevermore. All aboard!